as usual to the front pages of the papers and lots and lots of Mandela. There's a picture on the front of the Observer of Mandela when he first came to London in, I think, 1962. Um, their main story is about Blairites going to be taking over the running of Labour's election campaign and they say it's going to be, they present it as a kind of sinister um, takeover by men dressed uh, as a Spanish Inquisition, more or less. Alice the Camel and all, all of that lot are back, they say. The Sunday Times, um, its main story is, you heard on the news, it's about the 11% pay rise for uh, MPs, damned if they do, damned if they don't. And it says that Nigella Lawson there has won in the court of public opinion. Good for Nigella, but that is the most fickle and dangerous court in the land, I would suggest. Um, the Independent on Sunday has a picture of elephants on the front page. And um, the Mail on Sunday has a picture which for once will please um, David Cameron. Send them back home, it says a leading UKIP supporter, an ex-conservative. Um, that's the kind of anti-UKIP story that number 10 needs. Finally, a little bit of a boo, I'm afraid, for the Sunday Telegraph, who have sold their front page to Chanel No. 5. Now, there is a perfectly good and interesting newspaper inside this, but if they think this is the way to gain passing readers, I, I fear they are sadly mistaken. Anyway, after that little rant, over to Trevor MacDonald and Gillian Tett. So, Trevor, um, your interview with Nelson Mandela was, I think, the first when he came out of prison. It was, and um, for me it remains a most extraordinary moment because I couldn't believe that somebody who'd spent an unconscionably long time away, 27 years away, could come out so absolutely focused on precisely what he needed to do to move his country forward. And with such a conspicuous lack of, of, of bitterness. And you kept trying to get him to talk about the horrible time he'd had in prison and he simply wouldn't do it. He, he, he refused. It must have been awful for you, I said. I'm, you know, <laughs> I, was, I was looking for a headline, you know, Mandela tells MacDonald I was beaten every day. Not a word of it. All in the past, he said. I must now concentrate on the future and on my country's future. And in that, I mean, I thought, you know, I, I, I failed. I, I also failed to get him to acknowledge that there were any fundamental problems in coming to a political accommodation with the, with the National Party. Because we tend to forget, you know, he's this great figure, but he was a very, very shrewd politician as well. He knew exactly what he wanted to say at any particular time. Uh, he didn't give too much away, he didn't give his hand away. He was very shrewd, he was very self-disciplined, and he'd studied his, his, um, his Afrikaner opponents very, very closely. Yes. He spent a lot of time at, in Robben Island reading about their history and so on. And so he knew exactly how to approach them. He knew yeah. what he wanted and he knew how to get it. Gillian. Well, I was going to say, I mean, obviously the papers this morning are absolutely full of Mandela commentary. But um, I would pick up this particular piece from The Observer. It's very interesting. It captures a contrast. On the one side, we have a wonderful piece by Desmond Tutu echoing many of the points that Sir Trevor has made about the extraordinarily skill with which Mandela not only captured um, or mastered political theatre, but also showed such incredible forgiveness, understanding and empathy. But that's the older generation. The other piece that's very, very important is on the other side of the page by Sipo Hulongwane, who's a young South African columnist, who's pointed out that notwithstanding Nelson Mandela's extraordinary achievements, for the younger generation, he's increasingly starting to fade off the radar screen. And in fact, the point that he makes is the unspoken truth in South Africa is that he has been politically irrelevant since 1999. The problems in South Africa today remain very tragic, very big, and unfortunately, no one can try and think there's been a Hollywood ending with Nelson Mandela. He hasn't fixed the entire country, notwithstanding his amazing achievements. Well, in, in life, there are no Hollywood endings, of course. Trevor, I, I, I fear not, and, and, the, and the Observer has, has taken up this point about <clears> the post-Mandela world. I'm a little surprised that so many people uh, do this. I suppose it's, 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 it's um, obvious to do it you know, at the death of Mandela. But in fact, the post-Mandela world started a long, long time ago. Mandela was determined to spend only a few years in the presidency. And after that, you know, there was Thabo Mbeki and now Jacob Zuma. And so the, the, that, that world, the, of what he symbolized, has gone. And the Observer has this wonderful uh, memory of the moment that in 1995, when the Rugby World Cup, which South Africa incidentally won, which is a nice Hollywood ending, <laughs> um, yes. but that was Mandela Hollywood. did the wonderful thing of putting on the, the the t-shirt. The shirt of the um, Francois Pina. Su super supremacist white South Africa. Here really. was, in fact, a white supremacist yeah. shirt and Mandela did it. And he was, he was great at making these grand gestures, not grand speeches, but very, very important symbolic. And he was very good at shirts. I loved the story that when, when they all went to Buckingham Palace right at the beginning, the rest of the ANC leadership, he said, you've got to go to Moss Bros 
white tie and tails yes. at the palace. And they all said, OK, all right. And all these ex-guerrillas who turned up in white tie and tails, and he then he turned, turned up, up in, in his flashy in shirt, his shirt. Yes. laughing at them. No, 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 he did. He understood the importance of political theatre. That was a key thing. And you see, if you want to be um, have a cause for optimism in this very, very cynical age, yeah. I mean, another piece that I think is a great column by Andrew Rawnsley, um, again in The Observer, which basically points out that, you know, notwithstanding the fact you had so much political theatre, mm. you had brilliant political strategy, you actually, at the end of the day, also had a man who managed to put a sense of good back into politics. But it's so easy today to be very cynical about all the political process. Sometimes, just sometimes, good can come out of politics, right. and he showed that. Let's, let's turn now to Trevor. Um, you're talking about let's, other, other issues, and we're talking about good in, in life. We're talking also about what goes wrong this morning, travel glitches. Now, we saw in the news that all these people have been str yes. struggling in airports thanks I know. to well, I, a I, computer I, glitch, it says. I, I, find it, I find it quite extraordinary because here we are in this modern technological world yeah. where we are led to believe that all these problems will be taken care of and all we have to learn to do is to get our iPhones working properly and our iPads and our apps and all this sort of stuff. And in fact, these things provide a great deal of trouble. One, one glitch, one glitch in the system, and people are stranded, hundreds <laughs> of holidaymakers stranded for hours and hours and hours. And I think what's interesting about that, we've had the same problem with the, with the NHS, with, with the computers. Ian Duncan Smith's department has known problems in that same area. And across the Atlantic, Barack Obama's you know, health care plan, the plank of his second term of his presidency, it all goes wrong because people can't get on to the system with the computers. Yes. And this is, this is in America. This is not Rwanda. This is one of the most highly technologically advanced countries in the world. And, and a key political plank of his goes awry because you can't get the more The more sophisticated the technology, the more vulnerable we are rather than the freer we are. It it, indeed, it, it does appear so. It Julian, I'd like to turn to the British economy, I'm sorry. OK, British Moving economy. On. Well, for I'm those, rich, um, those rich foreigners who can actually get through the travel chaos to London, there's a great story here about what's happening to property prices in the nation's capital. I mean, the figures are quite extraordinary. Um, they're pointing out that there's been a t almost a 10% increase in property r prices over the last year, that you have $1.5 million averaged um, houses, two-bedroom apartments in central London, etc., etc. The reason this is important is that it's not just about London, it's about the British economy. And the big question is, can you actually celebrate a boom that's still being built so much on property price increases and a growing disparity between rich and poor? And is that sustainable or not? And debt. And I mean, debt, nearly yes. two trillion pounds worth of domestic and um, personal debt in this country at the moment, which is huge. Absolutely. And Chancellor George Osborne was, of course, in a very buoyant mood this week, unveiling some really better than expected figures yes. for economic yes. growth. But the quiz question is, is this just a sugar high? Is this actually going to last um, or not? Trevor, your next story, I think, is about teaching. Yes, there was a, there's a, there's a, a sort of great story about, um, a, a, about a, a head teacher who advertised for an assistant. And he, he, he got all these replies which were quite sort of illiterate. One, one person said, um, I like to see students blossom, for, for blossom, I think. And another had given his date of birth as 1053. And as part of his experience, he, he listed his experience flying a single-engine plane. And it goes on and on. And it's this, this general uh, conversation which we're having now as a nation about the quality, the quality of teachers. I think in many respects, teachers do a superb job and they're, they're pretty hard done by. But there are some fundamental problems in this system. And I think this is what this piece... But professional qualifications aren't everything either. You do need the no, charisma. exactly. You do need the... Yeah, exactly. The but I'm connect. not quite sure that you need the experience of flying a light aircraft. To, to, I'd, to, I'd love to, to know what happens when a, when a student bossoms, I must say. <laughs> Um, OK, my next one's slightly different. It's about Alzheimer's. Um, my mother just died of Alzheimer's recently and it runs in my family, so it's an issue of great personal interest to me. But David Cameron has come out and said that he wants to utterly commit to, to Britain leading the fight in the global fight against dementia. And frankly, here's another bit of political news that we can celebrate, because Barack Obama last year came out and announced $100 million towards a brain research centre there needs to be much more coordinated global action looking at this issue because at the moment the spending and research on cancer is dramatically higher than Alzheimer's and dementia even though it's a growing problem. So just a little plug for the fact that David Cameron has actually picked up a very important cause there this morning. Right. Um, I'm going to stick with you because the other thing I want to talk about, I mentioned it right at the beginning, was Nigella winning in the court of public opinion. I'm yeah, I would imagine many, many women across the country would have cheered about this because 
you know, not only is the story of Nigella something which is, you know, tremendously powerful and emotional, it's also quite a cautionary tale about what can sometimes happen to a woman like her who basically gets entranced by, you know, a rich man and thinks her problems are solved, if you like. Um, and it's a good warning to young children or young women across Britain who look at pretty women and think, right, you know, I'm going to get swept away and rescued. Very tragic story, but she has come through this week looking very dignified and essentially fighting back. Well, we were talking about the good importance of image and clothing. I mean, wow, she kind of, she's won on that one, didn't she? She looked like some kind of extraordinary Renaissance princess kind of sashaying her way into court. She did, but she did so in a very dignified way without hurling any insults and basically by holding her head high and... Frankly, this is probably, I suspect that after all this happened, she's going to come back even stronger than before. Trevor, one final thought on Mandela. I think there's a story in The Observer that struck you. Yes, the, 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 the story in The Observer is, is about, it's, it's a little bit again about the, the business of the, 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 the post-Mandela world and, and what a great kind of symbol he was to, to everybody. And I sort of also remember that, you know, one of the things is that he was absolutely... Um, realistic about what things you know the way things should work and I remember when I uh, on that first day that I met him at the at the end of this interview they all wanted him to come out and make a, a big speech about about freedom and about equality and about justice for all and so on mm. and he looked at this crowd and he said go back to school and then it sort of an intimation of political mortality the like of which I've never heard he said, he was standing with Walter Sisulu, another ANC stalwart, and he said, Walter Sisulu and I aren't going to be here for very long. The future belongs to you. Three days after his release, he's talking about the end of his, his, his premiership. Or his go presidency. back to school. Go, go back to school. That's a great man. Trevor, thank you very much for coming. Lovely thank to have you. And Gillian, too. Thanks, thank both. You. We'll turn to the weather now, as usual. And it's a